which is wonderful and fantastic, but the opportunity of God's love through us to others. Oh, 
how it says, lead me. Sometimes Jesus will lead us into places not just of, of great, you know, butterflies and rainbows. Sometimes Jesus leads us into the dark. Sometimes Jesus leads us there to know what we have to put down in the ground and bury with him. And it's painful. It's painful. But we know that there's a God who sits with us in the dark. Amen? Amen. We have a God who understands what we're going through. We have a God who sits with us in the pain and the uncertainty. And there's a story in scripture where Paul and Silas are, they're imprisoned, right? Because they pre they're preaching the gospel boldly and they're agitating the leaders. They're agitating the people around them. They're preaching the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so they're sitting in jail. And then it says at midnight, they started singing songs. And what happens is the earth begins to shake. And then as they're singing, everyone around them starts to sing. And then the, the, the earth will shake and then their chains fall off. Amen? There's something about singing in the dark that makes your chains fall off. There's power when you can sing in the dark, sitting with the Father. And so I just wanna encourage you this morning, there, there's a song inside of you that is yet to come out. Don't hold back. Don't hold back your song from the Lord. So let's sing together.
Yes, you are, Lord. further, let us get higher with you. Bring us higher. It's your presence that we're after. You are the prize. You are the goal. It's you who are after Jesus. So come and dwell in this place. Come and abide with us, Jesus. Come and mark us with your spirit.
come and blow through this place, Lord Jesus. Let us remove our pride. Let us remove all things that keep us away from abiding in the precious presence of God. We love you. We ask all these things under your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, go ahead and take a moment and say hi to one another. Say that the Lord loves you. If you're watching online today, so good to see you. We pray that God would bless you wherever you're at, in your home, in your car, wherever you're at. God loves you. Good morning, everyone. How are we this morning? Are we good? Yes. What a beautiful time of worship and just how amazing we get to just dwell in the Lord's presence this morning. It's beautiful. Well, good morning. My name is Elisa. I am the student ministry assistant here and trellis intern resident thing. Um, but I'm just so glad that you guys chose to worship with us this morning. You all look beautiful this morning. Um, but here at Bayside, we want to see more people become more like Jesus. That's our mission statement. And we believe you do that through getting connected, worshiping, and taking action. And that get connected, we can really do in so many ways. But if you're new here, welcome. We're glad you're here. But those next steps for getting connected here would be pulling out that QR code that is right in front of you in the pew. And you can fill out a connect card that's in there and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Say that you're here. Or even if you aren't new here and need to update some information, you can also scan that and do any prayer requests. We would love to pray for you. Um, so you can also scan that QR code that way as well. Or even go to our website at BaysideChurch.net to do that as well. If you do call Bayside at your, your home, and would like to give this morning, you can also scan the QR code. I say that they're magical. QR codes can wear lots of hats. So you can scan that QR code as well to um, give this morning. Or if you have your offering with you, you can uh, also in the pew in front of you. There's an envelope. You can drop your offering in that and put it in the black box on your way out this morning. Um, we have so many amazing things happening at Bayside. And the Lord is just planting so many seeds around us. And I am very excited to announce that we are launching our young adults ministry here at Bayside. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's super exciting. It's been very prayerful. And we just feel like God has been calling us to reach that next generation in God's kingdom. So we are super excited to be launching Pathway Young Adults. And we would love that if you are a young adult, that is ages, we're saying 18 to 28, um, I would love if you were to join us on our first gathering on May 5th, and we will be meeting in the harbor from 6 to 7.30 p.m., and it's just going to be a night of worship, food, connection, um, and just dwelling with the Lord. So we're really excited for that night, and if you aren't a young adult, I would still love your support, so be in prayer for this um, ministry launching, and if you're feeling called to leadership, I would love to talk to you about joining our team for that, so you can come and say hi to me as well, and just be praying over that as we're launching that. Our next fun thing that's happening is our brunch fundraiser. That is happening on April 28th, so just in a couple weeks. And this is a great opportunity for you to get connected to our students. So this brunch fundraiser is our last fundraiser for our summer camps for our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. We're taking them uh, like two different weeks. Our middle schoolers are going to go to SEU, I think. Yeah, SEU. And they do a week-long camp, and so does our high schoolers. Um, and we would just love your support in that. So if you would love to stop by after first and second service, we'll have a brunch meal for you. So you can stop in and support our youth ministry by doing that. Um, you guys are so faithful. Bayside is so faithful and we're so thankful for your generosity. And because of that, we are able to put on newcomers lunches. So just last week, we put on our newcomers lunch and we had an amazing community called Bayside Church, their home. So we are so excited to welcome our new people to Bayside. As you can see, all the beautiful people, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, thank you just for believing in what God is doing here and being faithful and just always giving. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the service. Can you hear it? Are you listening? God whispers to us. Can you hear him? Perhaps it is a feeling in our gut, a sudden insight, or a message that comes to us through his word. Or maybe it is the stillness of nature, or the blowing of the wind and the sound of waves crashing on the shore. Whatever form it takes, God is whispering to us now, inviting us to listen and respond. It is in these moments of quiet and stillness that we truly hear God's voice. And when we do, we have a choice to make. We could ignore it, dismiss it as just another thought or feeling, or we can embrace it and allow it to transform us from the inside out. God's whispers has the power to change us to move us, to heal us. It can give us the strength and courage to face our fears, to overcome our doubts, and to take bold steps towards a brighter future. When we follow God's gentle whispers, it has the power to shake the world, to bring about positive change and make a difference in the lives of those around us. So can you hear it? God is whispering to you. Are you listening? Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you guys today. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name's Stephanie. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayside for adult ministries and also for missions and outreach. And Pastor Terry, you might have saw on social media, he is in Virginia Beach this weekend with Christy and he used to pastor there, and they're having a big anniversary celebration. So I'm honored and excited to share with you this morning. We're actually starting a brand new sermon series um, this week. So we're going to kick off this sermon series on the Shema. And if you are not familiar with the Shema, that's okay. I did not know what it was the first time I heard the word. And it is this Old Testament prayer that we are going to dive in that has different commands in it that we'll look at each week. And so the word actually Shema in Hebrew, it means to listen. But it's a little bit different than what we think of when we think of listening, right? It's not just like hearing my daughter's voice sometimes <laughs> or hearing a bird chirp or hearing a message Sometimes this listening in Hebrew, the Shema, is also the same word as doing. And so when they say Shema, it's this idea of that we're not just listening to hear, but listening to understand and to respond. And so I really want to challenge us today, um, not my words that you would hear, but really the word of God, that you would really allow yourself to lean into this time that we have together this morning to really hear and listen for the word of God so that you can really press it into your heart, into your soul, listen for the Lord speaking to you and take whatever next step maybe he's calling you to. Um, not that it's about doing, but it's about being with the Lord and hearing from him. So we're going to focus on the listening piece today. Um, last week, you might remember, Pastor Terry gave us a message on how to study the Bible and so as we get into the Shema, we're going to use some of those tools. He talked about, um, you know, what translation you might want to start with. Also talked about the Bible roulette. I don't know if you guys remember, but I used to do this all the time when I was a first a Christian. So just flip through the Bible like, Lord, I trust you. Okay, this is for me. <laughs> And so he kind of told us where we can start in scripture, how we can start to unpack and study that. And so the Shema is going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, we're going to look at just a small portion today. But I just want to open us up in a word of prayer, just with that same idea of really hearing and listening for the word of God um, to respond. So let's go ahead and just have a word of prayer together. 
Lord, thank you so much for uh, an opportunity to gather with our church family today. Thank you for those that are watching online. And thank you for your word, Lord, that has the power to transform lives and our minds and situations. Thank you for your power, for our salvation, Lord, for the way that you are already at work in our lives, what we see and don't see. And I just pray that in these moments together, Lord, you would silence all distractions and that we would be open to really hear, to understand and respond to your word. And so, Lord, I thank you for today. Ask for your blessing on every ear, every person that's here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so when I was first taught how to study the Bible, um, some of the tools that I was told about were the who's, the what, the when, and the why. And so before you start to read into the scripture, you want to know the who's. And it's who is the author and who is the audience. So we're going to look at that, and then you have the what, the when, and the why. And so the what is really what is happening in scripture. What is happening when this um, piece of scripture is being given? Is it, for us, the Shema prayer? What, what period is it in? Um, you know, is it Old Testament, New Testament, before, like Pastor Terry shared with us, before the Exodus, after, before the exile, after? So it's important that we kind of know a context of what's happening in the story. When would be the actual time period that it takes place? And so what else do we know about that time period? What happened in history at that time? And then the why is trying to figure out, okay, what is the overall theme or the overall purpose here in the scripture? Like what is the author trying to convey to the audience? And so I do not know all this stuff by the spirit. <laughs> I have to look it up. And you can use Google, just make sure you're using a reliable source, whatever you click on, but I love to use the Bible Hub. It's my favorite Bible study tool. You can dig into commentaries. You can look for like the word Shema, like how many times is that mentioned in scripture? What other areas is it mentioned in? So it's a great tool. So I did all the research for us beforehand. And so we're gonna go over the who's and who is the author? The author is Moses. And the audience is the Israelites. And so sometimes when we're trying to get a context for the scripture, it's helpful to know what comes before and then what's said after. And so the Shema starts in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. But if we look at the first three verses ahead, before that, this is what it tells us. That these are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. And I just want to pause there because that answers like our what is happening at this time when it says that Moses is saying, like, I've been given these commands to teach them to you so that I can also observe you doing them as you're crossing the Jordan into the promised land. So we did last fall the series on Moses. And so in that series, we learned that Moses comes, he frees the Israelites from Egyptian slavery that they had been in for 400 years. And they set out um, into the desert for 40 years. And so now we're picking up where they are getting ready to cross the Jordan and take possession of the promised land. So that answers our what is actually happening in the scripture. And then in verse 3, notice how it says, hear Israel. So that word here is Shema. And so it's actually even coming before the prayer where he tells them, hear Israel. Be careful to obey so that it will go well with you, that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So he's really putting an emphasis on this Shema, this here to respond, because it's the way that he starts the prayer. Again, hear Israel. And so what period is this recorded in, time period? The first time that the Shema is recorded and it's recited in a service is in the first millennium B.C. 
So before Christ, first millennium. And I was thinking like, wow, I wonder what that has to do with 2024. And like this Old Testament prayer that was written for the Israelites, for the Jewish people, they didn't have Jesus. So like, how can we apply that today? And we're going to look at that a little bit as we're learning to listen, to respond. So it was the first millennium BC and the Shema, what is the theme and the purpose? It teaches us that the Lord is one and also how we are called to live out our faith. And so for us, when we hear that God is one, for me, it's not really like this, it's not a big surprise because I know Jesus Christ as my one and only higher power and other religions, they usually have one God. But during this time, when the Israelites were going through the desert, they would have gone through the land of Canaan and they would have come across a lot of different people groups, different religions, and most people groups worshiped many gods. They were polytheists. So even in our Exodus series in Egypt, we learned that the plagues really represented God's attack on their idolatry. Each plague represented the Egyptians idolizing some sort of God, lowercase g. And so now in the Shema, God is here to say, like, it's not that I'm just one God, your God among many. Like, I am the one and only God. And we call that monotheism. Mono for one. And um, this is against polytheism, which was very widely known. And so he wants us to know that he's the one and only God, but it's also a call to action. It's how our faith is lived out by loving God and loving others and what the prayer will tell us. So let's go ahead and get into the Shema. It's going to be in Deuteronomy 6, chapter, we're going to look at verses, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And so we're going to kind of study the first part of listening, but we'll hear in the scripture how there's kind of different commands that are going to be picked out each week. So verse 4 starts and it says, listen, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, Shema, O Bayside. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So he starts with telling them to listen, right? And later on in the scripture, it says, commit yourselves. Actually do these wholeheartedly. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them. Wear them. Get a tattoo of scripture on your forehead. I was joking. I said, wouldn't that be funny if I had showed up with that on my forehead? But that's not really what it means. <laughs> Write them down on our doorposts. So each week we're going to look at a different way that we can respond here to God. But today we're going to talk about listening to God. Before we get into that, I, um, most of you I think have heard my story, but if not, I did not grow up in church. This was the first church that I attended 10 years ago, and I was saved here. And so when I heard about this prayer, and I was doing research, and I heard about, like, how integral this prayer is to the Jewish faith, even today, like, it is the climax of their any service that they have. It is, like, the pinnacle prayer for them. And the only thing that I could really think of to compare it to was the Lord's Prayer, but really, I don't really recite that every day. I mean, I don't do it in the morning, in the evening. And so I wanted to ask a friend of mine. He's a Messianic Jew. And so he is Jewish, but he came to know Christ as a young adult. Um, he lived in Oklahoma, and he was studying weather and found Jesus in Oklahoma and got saved. And so he actually goes to church here. His name's Alan. And uh, I wanted to talk to him, like, tell me about 
the Shema because I knew that he grew up like devout Jewish boy doing all the right things. And so he did. He came into the office and he was just talking to me about how the Shema for the Jewish people, that it's not just a prayer, that it is really a way of life. That is like the way that they live their life, that it has been ingrained in them since they were small children, that yes, they still, all these years later, recite it every morning and every night. And he, don't tell him I told you this, hopefully he's not watching online, Um, he's preaching at New Spring, but he was so like emotionally attached to this prayer that he got emotional in my office. Like he started showing this like, emotion of just this faithfulness to God, to be part of God's chosen people as we all are now, Uh, but to have this prayer and to have to know that the one only true God picks each one of us. And so it was really beautiful. Um, He shared again that this prayer, every service that you would ever go to in a Jewish synagogue, this prayer is recited. It's also sung he would not sing it to me, um, but it, it is sung. And at Yom Kippur, which is the holiest of holy days, uh, it's when the high priest will go into the innermost part of the temple and he will offer sacrifices for the people's sin once a year. This is a practice that started way, way back. And it is still practiced by Jewish today. As Christians, we, um, we don't do that because we believe, as scripture says, that the veil was torn when Jesus went to the cross and that his sacrifice was enough for the sin of the world once and for all. But the high priest on Yom Kippur still goes in if you're Jewish and he offers the sacrifices once a year. And then the climax of this service is reciting the Shema, is reciting this prayer as they finish out their most important day of the year. So you guys can see, like, it is a big deal in their faith, and that's why we're looking at it. You know, not just to to tie it to the New Testament, but to really understand, right? God is the same God for every people group, for every time period, no matter what. And so Tell us, Lord, what do you want us to hear today? What do you want us to hear in the Shema? What are we listening for? A professor that teaches um, rabbinic literature said that the Shema causes Jews to fill an all-consuming love of God. It's a love that is unreserved, all-demanding, at all times, in all places, and in all circumstances. Nothing is excluded. Thoughts are to be focused words are to be spoken, and the deeds are to be done. And so again, that's just my challenge for us today. And I'm challenging myself too, guys, when I say this, that, you know, just because I'm up here teaching doesn't mean that I have it all together. People that know me know I don't. (laughs) But this idea of like, okay, let's really keep our thoughts focused. Every thought, let's keep it focused here. Every word spoken, every deed done, let's just posture our hearts that way so that we can really receive from God and respond in faith. Are you guys with me? Okay, good. So we're going to look at three different ways that we can really hear from God, that we can listen to, listen for the voice of God. We're going to look at hearing from God through scripture, hearing from God through prayer, and hearing from God through other godly people. So let's look at learning and listening to God through scripture. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so when we hear that the word is alive and active, what does that mean? We know it's timeless again, right? So it's always living. It's meant for every person of every time and every culture. But like, how can we really express how the word of God is alive? And I thought of an example. So 
I was doing a funeral not too long ago with um, Pastor Terry. He was going to open up the funeral, and then we invited family to share like a eulogy, words of remembrance, and then I was going to do the funeral message and then kind of close out the funeral. So typically when someone does a eulogy, it's anywhere from about five to ten minutes, and I haven't personally had to do one yet, but I can imagine that it is extremely difficult because you have to, maybe you feel like you have to, um, you know, like describe the essence of this person in five to ten minutes. Like, that's impossible, right? But you, you might feel that way. And so I can see how it could be very challenging. Um, but Uncle Tom had offered, that's what I'm going to call him, Uncle Tom, had offered to do the eulogy. And so Pastor Terry gets up, he does like a five, 10 minute opening, and then Uncle Tom comes to do the eulogy, and he did a beautiful job. He shared stories about this woman that I had never heard, things that she had done, um, places that she had been, different ministries that she was involved in. He did such a good job of really showing her life and her faithfulness. And he did not spare any detail because it was like 45 minutes long. And so I'm, I'm sitting down about 30, 40 minutes in like I've got to shorten my message because I certainly, you know, people have been here for a while. I'm thinking about trying to represent this woman and the family well. I don't want to keep them here for three hours. I know you guys don't mind, but no, I'm just kidding. And so I'm like, all right, I'm just going to read the scripture and then I'm going to close out the funeral. So I get up and I share that the scripture that says um, that the world will know we are disciples of Jesus by the way that we love others and that we're called to love the least of these and how well this woman did that that she loved people that were kind of unseen, unheard in society, that she loved people so well. People that maybe some people would say were unlovable, but she did it well. And how Jesus prepares a place in heaven for each one of us, that he is preparing a room. And it's not like any other room, right? This is made for you, for me. And I believe that when she passed away that day that she met Jesus in that prepared place, he knew her name and he told her, I know you because you loved the least of these and you loved well. And so we wrapped up the funeral, prayed, and we exited. So we're in the lobby and this girl, this young lady comes up to me and I can tell that she's pretty emotional already. And she says, can I just talk to you for a few minutes? I said, sure, I love to talk to people, you guys know. And so we go over kind of in the corner of the lobby and she is very emotional at this point. And she said, I didn't really know the deceased that well, but she said, when you were reading the Bible, and you were talking about Jesus preparing a place and how he knows us by name. She said, I'm Jewish, and I've never read the Bible, and I've never even heard anything about Jesus, but when you said that, something was happening to me, and she is crying, and like visibly you can see that the Spirit of God is at work in this woman's life, and she says, I just, I don't know what's happening. Like, can you help me? And I just said, it sounds like the Lord is really working in your life. And it is the first time, I bet I'll never do it again, that I've ever given someone like my phone number and a Bible at a funeral. (laughs) But it was such a good example of the word of God at work in this woman's life. And so I shared with Terry and Jeannie after it had happened. And Terry said, like, that's the difference, right, between the beautiful words that Uncle Tom shared, the beautiful things that he had to say, and the supernatural power of the Word of God, right? It has this supernatural power to transform us. I was saved by the Word of God. I heard the gospel, and it didn't happen overnight, but over time, I started to feel hope again, right? We have like 800 billion neurons firing at any time, but our minds can actually be transformed by the living word of God. It's incredible. And so 
The word of God doesn't just serve as this alive and active tool to transform our lives. It serves as protection, spiritual armor. It serves as comfort, encouragement in time of need. And it's the message of salvation, right? It's not another piece of good news like a baby or an engagement or a job promotion. It's the greatest news in the world. It is the greatest news that we've ever received that salvation is for us. It's found in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so Psalm 119, 105 says that, this is David saying, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And that's it. The word of God, we hear from God through his word. Like he gives us guidance. He gives us wisdom, direction. Maybe you're in a place right now where you really need a word from God. You know, maybe you need to figure out, like, what's next? Like, what do I do with this? Where do I go? Or maybe you're in a difficult situation at work. Do I, some, a lady in first service, do I stay or do I go? You know, waiting on that word. Maybe you're just in a waiting season, right? But we can really hear from God in his word. And remember, even with the Shema that we're talking about, we're not just going to be hearers of the word, but we are going to hear it to respond and to do. And James tells us the same thing. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For anyone that's a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like someone that goes to look at themselves in the mirror, then they walk away and they forget who they are, right? We don't want to do that. We want to look into the law. We want to read it. We want to obey it. We don't want to be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. And this is the one that is blessed by what they do, right? And so it's this tension between doing and being, right? We can't really do for God if we are not being with him, because then that turns into me doing for different reasons, right, for ulterior motives, but I want to be with God, and then what I do because of my love for God, that expresses my faith. That's how I express my faith and what I do. So we said listening in scripture for God. Our second way is that we're going to listen for God through prayer, and prayer is basically described as communicating with God, it says in Philippians, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And in 1 John, it tells us that the confidence that we have in approaching God is that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And so our prayers aren't just these words that we're sending up to heaven, right? God is listening. He hears us. And for me, you know, sometimes that's the hard part in prayer, in my prayer life, is that sometimes when I'm talking with God, I feel like I get lost in my place. There's a million thoughts on my mind, distractions are pouring in, specifically when I try to be still and silent to hear from the Lord, it's very challenging for me. And sometimes I fall asleep, you know, when I'm doing that, if it's like bedtime, different things happen. But I want to share with you, I've had recently one of the most powerful experiences that I've had in a very long time. And so I want to share this tool with you, because not just to share my story, but I want you to use it. And so um, I want to give a shout out to Lita and Megan Flores. They started a prayer group on Wednesday nights. If you're interested in learning more about prayer, um, I want you to go to that group and meet those ladies. But they gave me this powerful tool. So I don't know about you, but when I specifically when I first started praying and I first became a Christian, like I would pray up to heaven. You know, I would pray and I would typically, I would look up to heaven. Even if I was in bed, you know, I would still picture that Jesus was in heaven. And I really wouldn't think about him being in heaven. I just knew he was there. And if you ask me what he looked like, I would probably say like something like King Triton from The Little Mermaid. (laughs) Like, he wasn't a mermaid, but he did have a long white beard and long white hair, right? 
but we know that Jesus doesn't look like that. But in my mind, I just pictured a Jesus-like figure in heaven, not a mermaid, but this man, and I just didn't really visualize it a lot. I just spoke to God. But what I learned is that you can actually put Jesus wherever you want. I know it sounds simple, but listen, it's powerful. You can put him on the beach with you. You can put him in a forest, on a mountaintop, in the desert. Like Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So you can put Jesus wherever you want to. And they showed me you can actually create this special place where you meet with Jesus. Um, you can create it. And so in my mind, I have created this special place with the help of Jesus where I meet him. And sometimes we're just talking with one another and I'm actually visualizing myself in this place with Jesus talking to him. Other times we're just maybe, we're resting. You know, it's a time of rest. Sometimes like Jesus last week was like walking across this field with flowers and just kind of grazing his hand while I was talking to him. That's mine, but you can create your own. And it actually shows us on a brain scan, if you can visualize Jesus and you're praying at the same time, that it will actually show up on a brain scan because of the parts of the brain that you're using when you're praying. And it is transformational. But we have to take the time to do it, right? It's like any relationship. If you have made a new friend or maybe you're in a new relationship, you have to spend time with someone, right? You have to get to know them. What are they like? What do they like? What do they not like? What upsets them? What, uh, you know, what do they think is fun? It's how we learn about God, by spending time with him in prayer. God is funny. He will make you laugh, I promise. I promise. But also in his word, right, we learn about who God is. And so when we're really listening for the voice of God and we need a word from God, we've got to be in prayer. Amen? All right, so no King Triton business. So the last way that we're going to talk about today for really listening to God is through, and this, honestly, this is probably one of the most powerful ways that I actually have felt that I've heard from God in my spiritual life. My prayer life is on a different journey now, but um, this has been one of the most powerful things that has taken effect in my life, and that's through other godly people. Through other godly people, God will speak to us through other people. James 5.16, it tells us, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so in Celebrate Recovery, we would say it something like this, that if you want to be forgiven, then you need to ask Jesus for forgiveness. But if you really want true healing, you need to tell someone else. Let them pray for you. Let them come alongside you and support you. It is a spiritual discipline, and I know we don't talk about confession a lot, but it is a spiritual discipline that should be practiced by all of us. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful. There have been seasons in my life where I just felt like, you know, this job and everything was just a sham, that God was hilarious and he was just playing a joke, where I like couldn't even see myself in ministry. But there were other people around me, winners, people I wanted to be like, spiritual people walking in the fruit of the Spirit that were able to help lift me up, to believe in me, until I could believe in myself. And that's the power of what God will do through the lives of others. I've heard, I've heard so much from God through hearing the Word of God preached and taught on a Sunday morning from Pastor Terry. Like when I first became a Christian, I thought they were following me, the church staff, like on social media, because every week the message was speaking into my life. And so other godly people, give them permission. You know, tell someone, when was the last time maybe you went to someone and you said, hey, when you look into my life, like, tell me what you see. You don't have to answer now if you want some time to think about it, but tell me what you see. What do you see in my spiritual life? Where do you see spiritual fruit in my life? You know, do you see me living out my calling? Are there areas where you can see me grow? 
And so it's the power of giving others permission to speak into us and how we can hear from God and get direction. I love what Paul says in Ephesians about doing things together. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. It's how we understand the love of God. Like, I love hearing people's testimonies and people's stories Even the little short ones, like listen to what God did the other day, because it helps me understand more about who God is. Like Abby and I, we have very different stories. Abby grew up in church. I didn't. And we just, we have different lives. But when I hear what God is doing in her life, it gives me this whole new perspective of who God is. And it's what Paul is saying, that together— With the Lord's people, that's how we really understand and grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Amen? So he goes on to say in the next chapter that as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Right? It's about keeping that unity among a body of believers. Right? That if you need me to build you up today, I can do that because I'm, I'm full. I'm in a good season. But I'm going to need you in a couple months to do the same for me, and we're keeping that unity. And in line with the Shema that it says, right? Like we're called to be one just as God is one. That there's one body, there's one spirit. We were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, who is the God of everything, in all, for all, through all. And so... As we kind of reflect on these different ways that we listen to God through scripture and prayer and others, and that command that we get in the Shema to listen, to respond, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Let's talk just for a minute about how that applies to our Christian faith today, right? This prayer written in the first millennium before Christ Now we're in 2024 AD, and I live in Safety Harbor, Florida. What does this have to do with me and my faith, right? But it's really, it's the connection is in the greatest commandment. And it's what Jesus told us that the greatest commandment was. Jesus was Jewish. He would have grown up reciting the Shema morning and night. When he got up, when he went to bed, and he would have known it. And he actually recites it in one of the Gospels in Mark when he talks about the greatest command. It's in Mark 12, verse 28. It says that one of the teachers of the law came to him, and and they're listening to him debate. And he wants to know that which one of all of the commandments, all of the law, is the most important. And Jesus says that the most important one is this— And it's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself, and there's no commandment greater than these. In another gospel, he would say that like all the prophets, everything that they have ever spoken, and all of the Jewish law— hangs on these two commands, that we're to love God and love others. And it is the Shema, right? That's our way of life, is living out the greatest commandment, that we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And because of the love that we have for God, 
That's what we live out. We love others. That's how that the world knows that we're followers of Christ is because we love other people, not with an agenda, not as a project, but it's a way of life for us too. It's how we live. And so I'm going to invite Leo up <clears throat> as we get ready to wrap up here today because I really just, you know, as the challenge was to listen, to respond, I really just want to give us a moment to kind of reflect on those words and the scripture that was shared today. And what is God speaking to you? You know, maybe you need a word from God right now. You really need to hear from the Lord. I'm going to invite um, Lita from the prayer ministry and Pastor Bob's going to come up and they're going to be up here. If you want to pray with them, they're going to be up here and available for you to do that. Maybe you want to share the word that you're waiting on with them so that they can pray for you. Maybe it's just like a relationship that needs something healing or you just need an answer like what is next Lord for some of you maybe you haven't even had a conversation with God at this point maybe that is your next step is to say yes to Jesus and so we're going to give you some time to reflect and do that and then I will come up and close us in prayer before we exit today Lord I Oh, I need you Every hour I need you My one defense My righteousness Oh God, how I need you sing that together. Lord, I need you.
invite those that are still praying to continue and I just want to close us out in a word of prayer this morning um, you guys are so loved by Bayside by myself but the love of Christ is what he wants us to grasp onto how deep how wide how amazing that love is and so if you have not made that decision to put Jesus at the center of your life and to receive that salvation and that love, we do not want you to leave here today without doing that. I know sometimes there's some stirring that's happening and I know when it happened to me, I didn't really understand what was going on. Like that girl, I needed to ask someone, I needed help. And so we're here to support you in that. Um, we don't figure it out in one prayer, it's a journey. Um, but we do want to pray with you because the word of God tells us that if we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then that's how we're saved. That's how we receive salvation by the grace of God through faith. And so let's go ahead and, and close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for just so it's like this manual for our life and how we're to live and teaches us about who you are and who we are. And so, Lord, I just pray that every person that is here, Lord, would just lean into their identity in you, that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And we all need him because nobody is perfect and it's never going to look perfect, but we just keep pursuing you. We're desperate for you in your presence. And so, Lord, I just want to lift up people that are waiting on a word of God. They're waiting in a difficult season, in a hurting season, in relationships or work troubles or sobriety or depression, anxiety, whatever it is, Lord. I just pray that you would continue to just speak through them, speak into their lives in all the different ways that you do. And even when you don't, Lord, that we would keep our hearts in a posture of trust and waiting and being still because we know you're faithful. And Lord, for those that maybe they haven't ever had a conversation with you in prayer, or they don't even maybe know if they've received salvation, or they could just feel something happening because of what they've heard today. Lord, I know that's your spirit. And I know that we all need a savior because we can't fix ourselves and we're never gonna uphold anything perfectly, not the doing, but it's about being with you. And so, Lord, we admit that we're sinners, that we have a need for a Savior, and we believe that you are it, Jesus, that you are sufficient in all. And we believe that when we place our trust and our faith in you, and that you raise us from death to life, and that, Lord, that you cover all of our sins, that we have a new relationship with God, that we're connected because of you, and so, Lord, I just lift up anyone here this morning that that's their prayer as they just need you in their life for the first time or maybe to rededicate their life to you. 
And Lord, for all of us, that we would just live that out every day, the love that we have for you, the love that we have for others, and that you would continue to provide your wisdom and your direction and absolutely everything we need in those moments. And so, Lord, I just lift up every person that is here today, everybody online, Lord, every person that's heard this word, I lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, we love you. I hope you have a good week, okay? Bye.